Hi, this is Rachel Grunwald, Director of Programming at JW3, and I'm speaking to you from the beautiful Howard Hall, uh, which unfortunately at the moment is empty. As you know, we had to close our doors on Monday evening, but we are very much open. As you know, JW3 is not a building. It's a beautiful building, but JW3 is a project with a vital mission and vision. And now more than ever, we want to bring stimulation, inspiration and comfort powered by Jewish values, learning and life into your homes. So we're working really hard on digital programming for the coming months. JW3 TV, as you will have seen. Meanwhile, we've uploaded some of the best of our archive content from the last six and a half years, so please enjoy. This content's free, but as you can imagine, this is a difficult time for us financially. So if you can donate to keep us going, to keep a uh, cross-communal space where everybody is welcome in play and healthy for the future, please do so. Enjoy. Welcome to JW3. Sir Ben, Lady Arza, Marla, and extended Healthcott family. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Michelle Heyer and I'm the Holocaust Education Programmer here at JW3. Tonight is a particularly special evening as I've known the Healthcott family for a number of years. Morris and I go back over 30 years to study group and university and I've had the privilege of knowing Ben and Arza as my role here at JW3. Ben, we would like to congratulate you on your recent news of being on the Queen's Birthdays Honours List. just at the palace for Prince Charles' 70th birthday. The list of your accolades are endless. Founder of the 45A Society, successful businessman, you've represented Britain in the Olympic Games, you've worked for the Board of Deputies of many other charities and made such a po positive influence on Holocaust education. And we'll hear more about your incredible life story in a moment. We're honoured to have Michael Freeland and Daniel Finkelstein here with us today. We're going to discuss Michael's new book about Ben, the story of one of the boys. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions later. We're selling the book published by Valentine Mitchell afterwards at a discounted price of £15, and Michael and Ben will be signing. Michael, as most of you know, is a legendary journalist and broadcaster, and I remember listening to his radio show as a small child with my parents, you don't have to be Jewish, <laughs> which he presented and produced for 24 years. He's also famous for his biographies, and we are delighted that he's written this insightful book about Ben, who he's known for many years. Daniel is also a renowned journalist associate editor of the Times, himself second generation, as his mother, Miriam Finkelstein, was a survivor and dedicated much of her life to Holocaust education. This event is in conjunction with Jewish Book Week, and we're also having a reception, of which you're all invited, um, in the Youth Centre afterwards, sponsored by the 45A Society. So thank you, Angela, for your generosity. So without further ado, I would like to hand you over to Michael and Daniel, please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Thank you. Michelle, thank you very much indeed. We had a, a stroke of luck about this event. It was originally going to be on May the 24th, and for all sorts of other reasons we had to change it. If we held it on May the 24th, Ben and Arza would have known about his night that none of the rest of us. Uh, so uh, we can... Uh, you know, we have a, a great uh, moment where we can celebrate together this uh, amazing event. Uh, Michelle mentioned my mum and her work in Holocaust education. Well, my mum only really started talking in schools in the late 1970s and 80s, and I was watching a video of her the other day, and she was saying that when, after the war, she was first here, nobody really asked her about it, and occasionally it would come out at a dinner party, and people would be absolutely amazed by the whole story. And the fact that we are now talking so openly about Holocaust stories that we're beginning to try to understand them, that we're really actually at the beginning uh, of the understanding the Holocaust, not at the end of doing it. Lots of that is due to Ben Healthcott, actually, uh, and I think that's the reason why uh, he's been rightly recognised as a pioneer and has uh, been given this knighthood. It's not a mystery to any of us why that happened. It's a celebration of 
an entire movement and intellectual understanding of which my family um, played a part and uh, very much under his leadership. So uh, that's one part of the celebration. But the other part of the celebration to have for us, that's, is that we have a book to celebrate that uh, Michael Friedland has uh, written a really magnificent book, by the way, which I, I really recommend it to you, on uh, Ben's life. And we're going to talk about that today, and then hopefully you all will have a chance to ask questions. I, I, let me start, Michael, just by talking a little bit about the craft of the book. Do you want to, to explain to us why you did this, why this subject? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty obvious yeah. to me. And I think it's becoming so to other people too. I must say that also, I'd like to add my personal congratulations to Sir Ben. Um, sometimes I thought, I deserve the night of Dr. Wilkinson for three years. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been, it was a wonderful experience, a wonderful chance. And seeing it today in this lovely, lovely, wonderful institution, JW3, is, I think, terrific tribute. It's a marvelous place. And I tell you, even if it doesn't work out so well tonight, the salt beef is terrific. <laughs> <laughs> the, idea, the, the idea of the book, yeah, it really started with my publisher, and um, my dear friend Stuart Cass. He knew that I'd been, fascinated is not the right word, I'd been enthralled by the, the terrors and the horrors and the, everything, everything else so despicable about Nazism and about the Holocaust in general. I'd been to Auschwitz when it was looking very much like Auschwitz did in 1945. I went to Belsen, the, the uh, commemoration of the liberation of, the, of that camp. Um, I had several friends who were survivors. One of my dearest friends was um, Rabbi Hugo Green, whom I loved. There's no, no question about that. But I also loved the, the fact the achievements of people like that. And I was talking to Stuart and saying, I don't think that the, the Hugo book is going to, going to materialize. And he said, I know what your next book should be. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, Ben Health God. And I thought, what a lovely idea. And we, Ben and I had lunch, and we talked about it, and we talked about it. And he said, well, wait a couple of months. I think there's somebody else interested in doing it. Don't mind like hearing that. But it was a, <laughs> it was a chance to, what should I say, to cement a friendship and, and to educate myself in what Ben and what the survivors went through. And to say as one of the boys, he is the boy. Tell me how you put it together. So uh, it's, uh, how did you split it between interviewing the subjects, because there's a lot of Ben in it, there's a lot of Marla in it, uh, there, there's a, a lot of, um, sort of your own reflections and some of the places you went to. But how did you split it between the kind of academic research and memories? Uh, what was the way you I actually didn't want it? much academic research. That was what I was after. I thought it was very much Ben's own story. Because around Ben's own story was the story of the Holocaust. The story of somebody who was right at the beginning of the, uh, September the 1st, 1939, which was the day that Poland was invaded. He experienced as a child walking through, uh, walking through a forest on fire in a small town with body parts lying around, animals cut to pieces. And this was, you know, he was what? Six years old? Nine years old. And to have gone through all that right from the very beginning. And he didn't stop. That's the whole thing. It's a continuous story. And through him, you know, he went through camps, he went through ghettos. So there, there was no question of saying, uh, in the, in the get, ghetto of Pietrokov, that, that there were so many people. We did do that. I did do that. But it wasn't going to be an academic book. It wasn't going to be a book. I didn't want it to be a book about the story of the Holocaust itself, the, how it came about, the Venice Agreement. I didn't want to touch that. He tells a story of being chased by a Nazi with a whip and a dog. Ever since then, he's hated, hated dogs. Hated, you know, what, what, what that conjured up in my mind? The personal story. The personal story of knowing that his mother and his sister were being shot. He didn't have to have a, have a telegram to any of that. It was there in the town where it happened. And so it went on. And then, of course, the fascinating story was that out of this, 
within a decade of leaving, leaving Buchenwald, this man represented his new country, England, Great Britain, in the Olympic Games, not just once, but twice. Now, who could think of that? And people say to me, what did he do in the Olympic Games? I say, he's a weightlifter. Gone. Never. One of the thing, things, actually, that's it's interesting, that last point. So one of the things that my mother often said is um, uh, she was always a per she wants to be seen as a person first, as a mother, as a teacher, uh, as part of her community, as a family member, and only then to be thought of as a survivor. Uh, that was an important part of her life, but she didn't want to define her. Uh, and so you had this decision, because Ben's had this amazing life, obviously much longer after his Holocaust experience, and as an adult, with... Um, with episodes in it that would make a biography all by themselves. How did you decide to split the book between telling us his Holocaust story and telling us then what happened? It's basically chronological, so it was sort of time. You had to make a decision about proportions, though. Well, yeah, Ben may not agree. Um, I felt the Holocaust story was the story. Um, the fact that he was an athlete painted a very fascinating story. But he, he may not agree that I, I didn't pay a, a, the sort of attention I think he may have wanted to the various organizations that's involved in. I didn't want to reduce the impact of the very story by other things. You felt it was a bit like, um, apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you do the thing? Well, that, there was a risk of that. There was a risk of that, yeah. That, by the way, was one of my mother's favorite. <laughs> or Mrs. Kennedy, how, how was the rest of the ride at Dallas? <laughs> Yeah, well, so, but I, I must say too, we were talking about the mechanics of it, how it worked. It wasn't totally different to books I've written about Frank Sinatra or Bob Hope or uh, Elvis Presley. It's a story of an interesting person, and the, the, if, if he wasn't an interesting person, it wouldn't have been an interesting book. But it was a, uh, an act of dedication, I think. Um, I know that part of the answer to this will be lots of people, but who do you want to read the book? So when anyone does any writing, certainly in my case, I always have in mind somebody who's going to read this book. Who did you have in your mind as you were writing? Difficult question. A difficult question. I would like Holocaust and I to read it and to know what they're, what they're, what they're out denying. And that's very, would be very important. I don't think it's going to happen, but I think it would be very good. I think schools ought to have, it would be very nice for me, anyway, if schools put it on their reading list. It would be very good if book clubs would feature it. It's a, it's a book that needs conversation. So in other words, it, it, you could write a book, of course, of this kind, because that is so celebrated in our community that it was aimed at people who kind of know, uh, but you really were aiming it far beyond that because I think his life is far beyond that. Um, I think he's a great, look, let's face it, the fact that he has been awarded this knighthood is a great tribute to England Jury too. Yes. And that's also something I want to put on paper. Okay, so that's, that's, I really just wanted to sort of establish at the beginning the craft of putting a book like this together. Uh, but uh, now I want to, to talk about the story itself. So um, let's talk about what you regard as the heart of the Holocaust story that you were trying to tell. Maybe give us a flavor of that. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I think, you see, Ben denies something that I made a point of stressing. Time and time again when we met, he said he wasn't a slave laborer. Wasn't a slave laborer. He was working from early morning to early night in various factories, um, living in unsanitary <coughs> conditions without a penny or a kopeck or whatever it was. Uh, and went where he was told to go. I'm going to say that's, that isn't exactly freedom, and it wasn't freedom. Except, and this is the interesting point of it, because he was this, quote, slave laborer, end quote, he didn't go on the, the original transportations from Pietro transports. He didn't go through a lot of the torments that other people did, who his life lasted, thank God. Uh, I, I think that, that in itself is, is it gives it a slight difference. Uh, also the fact that he did strength and determination. You know, he was, 
I'm, I'm doing a, a project at the moment with a man who voluntarily is, is to use his own words, going to a concentration camp. He's had a, going, going to a health camp in Germany, run, run by a man who is known as the Commandant, as far as I'm concerned. And they are existing on 200 calories a day. Well, Ben existed on little more than that when he was in, in Buchenwald and all the other places. And yet he survived. He survived because of it. I think, no, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, but the sense of determination. He talked about his fear for his family. He loved his father, without any question. I said in many ways it's a love affair between Ben and his father, Moshe. Um, he'd known what had happened to his, to his mother and to his, and to his sister. Which, and and Marla is here, the other sister, who has the most fantastic story that I've tried to tell. Um, Actually, let's just, do, just pause there, because that is very interesting. Although the book is obviously uh, uh, about Ben, um, I've had the privilege of hearing Ben tell his story, so I kind of knew some of the outline. One of the things that I learned and knew from this book, which is, is Marla's story, which I didn't know, uh, and uh, contains some uh, extraordinary uh, features, in particular uh, how she was originally not taken with her mother. Yeah. Do you want to tell us more about that? Well, first of all, she'd been, Marla, I think I'm right in saying, for, it's been a long time since, we, since I wrote it, but uh, the fact that she was due for a transport and they sent her back again. And then the day came when the Jewish police, uh, this, is, this is one hell of an indictment of, of some people, the Jewish policemen who saved their own skin, so they thought, by acting as uh, surrogates for the Nazis. And a Jewish policeman led a group into their bedroom where her mother and the youngest sister was uh, shivering, shaking, screaming, crying, whatever you think, whatever you could imagine, they're about to be taken away. And the mother, Sarah, said to Marla, hide under the bed sheets. We'll say you're not well. And this swine of a policeman who pulls them out of the, out of the house, let her stay. Now, how did that happen? It's the most incredible story. I thought this was one of the most interesting because it, you come back to this question of Jewish police a few times, and it was—it's very interesting. Who well, mostly ended up like I think all the others did. So, uh, you know, you make your position sort of relatively clear. You're you're, you're very clear-eyed <coughs> in a very clear-eyed way, completely unsympathetic. Do you, do you think that's a fair judgment? Because of course, these people were also operating under an immense amount of pressure and uh, suffered huge moral dilemmas, uh, but you maybe um, didn't quite see well, it that I'm, way. Is that, no, is that I'm, I'm, I'm putting it in, in a position what I would have done, and I don't know what I would have done. I really honestly don't know what I would have done. I don't think, I don't think, you know, if I felt that my life was, was being saved, or possibly my parents' lives. That, that's, a, that's a different thing. There were people, Ben told me about people, who were joined the police to save their parents' lives and didn't. Some did. I think I would have taken every step possible to save my parents' lives. I don't think I could have killed somebody else to do it. And I think that's, uh, I think that, that would be the, the breaking point. I mean, one of the course of the great dilemmas of the book and of the whole situation is one can't know them. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's true, and you're honest about that too, obviously. The, the other thing, and you have a dialogue in the book that goes with Ben, which is absolutely fascinating, about the poles. And this is a very ah, interesting I dialogue to me because my father, interestingly, one of the things that I learned is you're virtually a twin of my father, Ben. Um, my father was born in Le Vouf in the beginning of December 1929. Uh, so you're virtually a twin of my father. And uh, one, when my father was uh, on his deathbed, actually, he talked to me about how important it was to him uh, that people not blame the poles. Uh, and uh, he, he always felt himself to be a Pole. And interestingly, there's some of that in your dialogue, but you're not so sure. I'm not so sure because I find, I find it incredible, actually. I find it incredible. Um, he's equally sympathetic with today's Germans, I understand, today's Germans. Uh, I would have expected him to say, you know, I hate Poland, I want all those sort of things. He loves Poland. He's received honours in, in recognition of that fact. 
Um, and yet, I find it literally incredible. There's a story there, one of the most moving stories for me, is what I describe as a one-man pogrom that he suffered. On the way back to his hometown of Berchikov, uh, with a young cousin, much younger than me, and they're stopped by two men, Polish policemen, who instantly threaten them with death, who take them to a terrible place, empty their suitcases, and all the time that they're with them, they know that they think they know they're going to, going to be killed. And don't forget, this was the time of the not so little mini programs. Various, various places in Poland which suffered after having suffered the Nazism. How, how can you become like that? I don't, ben, I don't understand it. I didn't understand it when we spoke about it. I still don't understand. Do I admire it? Yes. I went to Poland with you. I went to Poland with you. to Warsaw. And people love him. And he loves using the Polish language. It's a culture that very much ingrained in him. And I think it's wonderful. But I don't, well, I don't understand. Okay. My, my grandfather, uh, after the war, and he did a lot of Holocaust uh, education work, he accepted a medal from the federal German government. It was quite a controversial decision. And I think one of the reasons he did it is he didn't want them to take his Germanness from him. So maybe this is all about not uh, uh, resisting the idea of taking his Polishness from him. Maybe he didn't want to lose that. Is that a fair description? It probably is. Probably is. But I wonder how many people in the same boat would have, would have done that, particularly the individual suffering. But you know what? We've talked about the last, the, the, the post Holocaust years. And what strikes me about Ben, two things. One is what a wonderful family man he is. That comes first. Did that come from the deprivations of the Holocaust? I don't know. He's a good Jewish father. But the determination to, just, to survive. And I never heard, apart from that one incident, Ben talking about his own fear of dying didn't happen. I think he knew all from the beginning he wasn't going to allow it to happen. And that's the Ben, ben Helfgott who became the, um, the head of Jew Jewish um, Holocaust, educa Holocaust education and all the other things he's done for the cause. I mean, Morris and I were talking about uh, this incident also when he goes home and this book one that you just mentioned um, because it is one of the most shocking ones in the book. But I, and there's also another, uh, I thought, really interesting incident and that is uh, after liberation, in, in which Ben uh, saves a woman from being attacked by uh, uh, yeah. other Jews, as far, as far as I can understand. Well, these people who went to shot with them, and the, the first day of freedom, and she walking out. Can you imagine this? See, this is another lovely thing that, that, that he's able to tell me about about the reaction to those years of terror and tragedy. <coughs> and, Breathing fresh air for the first time, going to the town near Teresa, looking in shop windows, and then seeing a woman with her baby being beaten by inmates of Teresa Shed himself, and he breaks it up. You know, that, that takes something to it. You know, the, there's no question of the hatred boiling over. But again, you write with that with wonder and admiration, but I'm not sure with. Comprehend, you know, I'm not saying that you looked at it and didn't comprehend it, it's more that you write, frankly, of your sort of right. wonder about it. I think I'll tell you the other thing that was pretty interesting about it, uh, which I thought was very characteristic, was that um, uh, when other people were going to collect money after being released, uh, Ben decided he was going to collect food. I thought that was uh, pretty smart. Um, <laughs> well, there's a, lovely, there's a lovely story about Ben and food, actually. He said that one of the favourite times of the year is Yom Kippur. He fasts all day, but he says he knows at the end of that day there's going to be a big meal waiting for him. He said he fasted every day for six years and knew there would never be a meal at the end of the day. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the period after the war. Uh, to, I mean, first of all, it's impossible to talk about someone who's uh, been an Olympic uh, an Olympian and who was obviously a captain of our team as well, um, without you know, having to get into a fair degree, you probably had to have a fair understanding of weightlifting. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but that may not have come naturally. <laughs> <laughs> I think it did, actually. It's just enough sport. Sport is so for you. Oh, for me? <laughs> you have to understand. I understand he is. Listen, I'm a Jewish boy. What do you expect? <laughs> I just certainly am not going to be awake at the <laughs> But um, tell us how you got your head round that. Uh, again, was that... Um, well, something? You look, uh, a biographer in particular, but I suppose any writer, looks for the strange things that happen and the strange circumstances. And it's with, with wonderment, you know. Uh, this, is, this is a great story. Yeah, it goes along, goes for a walk along, I, I believe, uh, Hampstead Deep, and he sees some weightlifters. He said, I'd like to do that. Yes. And the man says, uh, no, you won't. He said, no, I want to. And he goes, look at the first time ever pick up barbells. And the man says, you'll be sorry. What was it, sorry? Became British champion. How many times? I, tell me how many times? Seven times. And then, and then, and then, captain of the of the team in the Olympics. Not just there. Not just a, a member of the British team. Captain twice. You must have had some uh, reflection. There are two possibilities. Rob. One is um, these. Are, these are effectively uh, coincidences. We have this person with this incredible story who's also got this amazing athletic ability and willpower necessary to do the sport. And the other is the idea that they're connected, okay? That um, it was the willpower that he, and the drive that had seen uh, Ben survive and had seen him through these stories that also led him to be able to conquer this uh, sporting, to, to climb this sporting hill. So which of, the, which of these uh, would you subscribe to? All of them, I think. Literally, or it'd be too difficult for me to. But you know, one of the interesting things is <coughs> that this continues throughout his life. Um, like the boys, most of the boys joined the Primrose Club in, in London. The club just for it started, became more than that. But a club intended for Holocaust survivors. Uh, the leader of whom, a man called Yogi Meir. Yogi, obviously the name of Yogi Bear, uh, who himself was a uh, German-Jewish athlete who would have been in the 1936 games had he not been Jewish. He founded this club and immediately picked Ben out as the, as the chairman of the club. That was him. He knew straight away. He knew he could depend on him. He knew his talent. Everything he did was, was of the best, you know. And that, that, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Because I've just you know, plucking this man and saying, but, it, but, it, but it's true, except swimming. He never grasped swimming. I admire you for that, actually. <laughs> well, look, Sebastian Coe is brilliant at every sport, but can't stand swimming, so maybe you'll be a bit of that. Um, so, you're, so you're a biographer, and you're now very familiar with uh, Ben's story. You've got all this other historical uh, um, experience under your belt. What sort of a job do you think Martin Gilbert made of the boys? It's a very different book. It's very, very different because, you know, Martin Gilbert was, a, was a, an ace historian, brilliant historian, and, and obviously it was a Churchill family to agree for him to become the, the authorised bi autobiographer of the Churchill life. He, he could be no slouch. He was terrific. One of the criticisms of Martin was that he just told facts, he didn't comment. And his was much more details about the people rather than telling their, 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 their whole stories. Um, and I just focused in on it. But I, I took a lot from his book. Of course I did it. It's an incredible achievement. To get, to get that book, book published anyway was an achievement. This big? Marvellous. But it was, a, it, was, it was certainly a help. But I deliberately, probably because of that, deliberately wanted to make this Ben's story, writing a biography of an interesting person. So if you had to add in comment into Martin Gilbert's facts about the boys, what would that be? Probably the, the authentic, the... Um, just trying to think of the right word for that. Probably the, the, the only true history of, of, of the group. I think that's true. I think that's true. And, but it's telling a more universal story, though, about that kind of period. 
of arriving after of being here after all that had happened um, and that kind of strange mixture of normality yeah. and abnormality that that constituted and the girls who, and, the, and the girls who came came known as the boys you know? yeah. Yeah, I've read recently, very recently another book about the Holocaust, because you can't, you can't take me away from them, called Conan, about a, a village, a shtetl, in effect, just about the one village, and it features a couple of people I happen to have known. And the story there is so much like the story I've tried to tell with Ben. You know, the, the, incident, the incidentals, there's one, one thing I've quoted a lot of times since then, and I only read it four weeks ago about this little village which are about to appoint their rabbi. And they worried about him because he um, wore a smart suit and had cufflinks. And the, the Hasidim in the village didn't like this. They said, a rabbi should be a bissel shrumpetik. <laughs> and I thought that is, you know, that is so much part of that story. And the stories Ben tells about people, we've got a list of the shops. We went to, um, we went to Pietro ourselves three years ago, and um, we found the bank, and we found the next store, and we found various other super stores, etc., in the square. Uh, but there was when Mr. Sunson had his dairy, and this is where this is where the baker was. This is the man who sold pickled herring, and that brings it to life. And I, I think you know, if we can do that, then, then, uh, that's what I wanted to do. Also, I felt I, I owed him and I owed the, uh, the boys something. I often think that we're all survivors in a way. Every Jew is a survivor. Tell, tell us a little bit, um, before we go for a moment, a little bit about the 45 uh, Aid Society. And, and, and well, you see, that was another one of Ben's ideas. And I did it devote a chapter of the 45. He decided... <coughs> And it's all very well, friends gathering, because they came friends, they came brothers and sisters. But there's something else to be done. Because although one stage Brent, Ben says they all did so well, and I said, no, they didn't. No, he said they didn't. There were heart-rending cases of, of uh, survivors on the poverty line. Survivors who have psychiatric, psychiatric troubles, and all sorts of troubles. The boys gather together to say, we have a duty to help each other. And since then, they, they, they had meetings. They do have their fun. You know, they do have their annual dinner, etc. But at the back of their mind, that, that has been the story behind it. And doing all sorts of things. My own shawl in, um, it used to be my own shawl in, in Elstree, dedicated to the Safer Tower, you know, because they wanted the name to go forward. Anything that links our lives with their lives is part of their remit. One of the things I loved actually in your description of this was uh, the extent to which the dinners were a celebration and Ben was uh, eloquent on this because, you know, I certainly think in a half hour I regarded uh, Shabbat actually with my parents as being really a celebration of survival every time, right? And so you can of course, my mother always had this phrase that you, you um, people who only look at the holes in the Emmentaler, right? So she was always assuming the cheese. And um, the, the, I love it. the truth is that um, I think that's a little bit of what this effort was. It was also looking at survival and celebrating that. I, I do want to ask one last thing, which is obviously the <coughs> great achievement of Ben was to make people uh, understand that we needed to educate about the Holocaust. That the Holocaust had these amazing lessons that people, that the sheer stories would convey something. That's very important. I think people are unaware of the extent to which um, the very concept that there was a Holocaust is a fairly modern understanding. Uh, and um, so, as you were writing this book, you must have seen that, as well as contributing to Holocaust education by writing Ben's story, you were also telling the story of how Holocaust education itself began. I think the, the, if there is a lesson of that, then, it's finally, and I say finally because it took a long, long time for other survivors, Ben was never in that group, who just didn't want to talk about it. It was too painful, too raw for them. And somehow or other, they realized that the rawness could be eased by telling their story. That's part of it. And also, when the, they, they began to be subject to persuasion. 
that you're doing something for us, for the cause. We owe it to six million people not to forget. And I think the crunch is going to come before very long, when there aren't survivors around who are eloquent like Ben, who can tell the story so well. I think that is, that's why Holocaust education is so very, very important. I'm going to tell you a personal story um, a few years ago that made me feel sick to the American expression, sick to my stomach. My late wife and I were in a pre in the supermarket. And uh, in front of us was a lady, a woman, a woman, she was no lady, with a grandchild in the queue talking to the checkout girl. And they were having a conversation. And they were talking about going to Ireland. We heard all this. Uh, the checkout girl was, um, had a girl in the army, and the woman was saying how much she loved Ireland. Now, my wife, who was the easiest, gentlest person, said very politely, excuse me, are you going to be long? And the woman said, look at them, they're pigs. No wonder you put them in the oven, that's what you do with pigs. And if somehow or other people would, could find a way of not saying that, not thinking that, then there's a, there's a job well done. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, and particularly for that powerful story. Um, now I'd like to give everyone a chance that I've had the privilege of having, uh, and that is to ask questions. So if you raise your hand, I will. It's a little difficult for me to see because I'm spotless, but oh, right, now it's easier. Uh, who would like to, uh, who would like to start? Who would like to start? Talk to Ben, of course. Um, Can you all uh, identify yourselves? Oh, start? sorry, I'm Laura Marks, and um, I'm wondering, having written the book, what is it that you would like the legacy of your book to be? Like, what what would you like uh, people to take out of it and to happen as a result of you having written the book? Well, I think really that's what I've been saying. Um, that is, uh, that there's a message behind it all. And the message is that human, what humans can do to other humans, it is, it, it's a point of personal story that I think opens up the whole, the whole story. A bit convoluted, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. It's a, you're saying that um, it's one thing to understand statistics, geographical movements, maps, and quite another to experience it through a personal story. And I, I always find it very interesting, the more that you read, however often you hear a story, uh, you learn things, and you learn things reading them again. You know? So True. I've had the opportunity to read, read some of the sections of your book more than once, and you, know, you learn more each time uh, so, um, from a personal story. So uh, I think that's one of its, its triumphs. Lady over there. Um, you just wait, if you just wait for yes, you, yes, no, you, yeah, there, yeah, just there, yeah, and uh, just what everyone waits for the microphone. When it comes, yeah. uh, my name's Linda Rosenblatt. Um, I just wondered, you didn't carry on after sort of post Holocaust, post, post liberation of Ben and everything, but could you just explain a little bit what whether Ben encountered any resistance um, when he first embarked on his crusade to teach the Holocaust, to have Holocaust education? Uh, become very prominent in this country. Uh, I know he was very much involved with the the um, the begin at the very beginning. You know, it was early days, and was there any political resistance? Was there any? Education? I think the I think the remarkable thing about that is the support he got, not just from other survivors, not just from the Jewish community, not just from people who are in education, but also from our politicians. You know, there's no coincidence that he got a knighthood this week. It should have happened a long time ago, as Daniel says. But, you know, his contribution to Holocaust education 
is a whole is a, a contribution to the culture or the intelligence of, of this nation of which we're all proud to belong. I, I mean, I, you, you talked about one story illuminating, you know, Ben's story illuminating the story of the Holocaust, but it's also true that the story of the Holocaust as a whole illuminates the case for liberal democracy, and so uh, I think that's become increasingly clear yeah. to, politi to politicians hit the, and that lesson, the importance of liberal democracy isn't you know, it's something we can just rely on people knowing about. So and it's international it's too, so and not just in Poland, and not just in, in Germany. I think, I think the fact that he does go to Germany, the fact he does go to Poland, and it's reported <coughs> there, in those countries, make, can only make people think. And his, his, his Polish language gives help to Hi, Michael. Uh, Dan Patterson. Uh, my dad, David Patterson, talked about, he, uh, in the framework of Havonim, meeting the boys and getting them involved post-war uh, in some of the activities. But presumably, if Ben's born in 1930, they were over here at the age of 15, or, or yeah. young. And what was the framework for where they were at that point? Then? Were they all together in an institution? Did they all go to other families? I think, I think institutions is, a, is the wrong word. Thanks to uh, several people in the Jewish community, with the help of the Home Office, they were settled in various places. Uh, ben himself was near we Lake Windermere, which made a nice change from Buchenwald, I must say. And they, they learned to play cricket, and they learned to play football, and they learned team spirit. And, and that was so important to them, because they themselves, for the first time, were being shown the respect of being, not just Holocaust survivors, being human beings. We're treating you like human beings. And the local authorities treated them like human beings. They were pretty rough with them sometimes, with medical examinations and things like that. But it sort of established them here. And when they went to, uh, to Primrose Club, which most of them did, they were encouraged to believe that it's not just football and it's not just cricket, but learn about the country, learn about the government of the country. And they did. And it was from, from Primrose Club in northwest London to the docks, dockside the London, the London docks, the local grammar school, Plasto Grammar School, that Ben went every day and gave the facilities of the club for his homework in the evening when he got back. That, that illustrates so much. Yes. Um, the, over there first, and then eventually, so you know where to go, there's going to be that question is going to be up right at the top. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Izzy. <coughs> um, you spoke a little bit about Holocaust scenarios and how you specifically want them to read your book. I was just wondering if you've had any interaction with um, people with these views and how you approach them, if you have. With people who? Holocaust deniers. Have I? Have I myself or has been? <laughs> um, have you in your intellectual work and research you've done surrounding this Intellectual work, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have. I said about this woman in the, the pig story, at least she wasn't a Holocaust denier. <laughs> <laughs> I once, I once was, um, and I was once in a, a, a rather posh cafe in Mayfair, sitting a table away from David Irving, and I wrote a note on a, on a serviette saying, "I hope it chokes you." My wife, <laughs> my wife wouldn't let me deliver. Yeah, I have been with David Irving. Uh, the, 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 uh, I've frequently uh, attempted to engage Holocaust deniers by promising to actually introduce them to the facts, but it's interesting that, that it's very hard they won't then engage with you. Uh, so uh, I'm afraid that trying to separate people from their notions is extremely difficult to, uh, to do. But all that we can do, you know, is really just um, present facts, and I've always thought that 
these personal stories are very hard to deny. If you, if you, in politics, you know, if you um, make some broad statement, it's always really, really hard if someone goes, well, I have had this experience. You can't deny those experiences. You have to, you have to grapple with them. You have to understand them. You can't just dismiss them. So people's personal stories are incredibly strong, but hardcore Holocaust deniers are just very difficult to deal with. It's getting to people before they get to that stage. I think. That's I think also, I think also, um, people, non-Jewish people, are were seen by me, only by me, because I became very sensitive to this as a very young junior reporter, as being too eager to forgive and forget. You know, I remember thinking, you know, you, you, your father fought in the war fighting Hitler, you know, how can you even think of this? It came home to me once uh, when the, one of the reporters, a much more senior woman reporter, said to me, yeah, but the Germans are such lovely people, Michael. And, you know, what do you do? What do you say about that? I must say, though, an uh, interesting experience that Adele and I had last year, we went to Germany on a Jewish heritage tour. And I have to admit, I was very, very struck by the efforts being made by the Germans today to make, you can't make good, but to remember the past. Place after place we went to, the plaques, Commemorating, I think the word that the horrors cropped up uh, one after the other. Um, little tablets in the street, the names of survivors, oh, so on the contrary, of people who died in the Holocaust who previously lived in those premises. We went to one town where there had been an anti, there had been a, a Nazi demonstration. Uh, 800 people were there, but 1,500 people, this was in Bamberg, 1,500 people were there to protest. That was encouraging. Uh, in Bamberg itself, a street named after a Jewish man. The Jewish man was, uh, died as a result <coughs> of Kristallnacht, running into the local shul <coughs> to save the Sefer Torah. They'd named a street after him. So there is that side that must be recognised. Yes, hello. It's uh, I'm Joe Brooks here from the Association of Jewish Refugees. Um, my question is probably the polar opposite to the previous question. Um, I've actually just finished um, reading um, and reviewing your book um, for our monthly journal, which goes out to sort of a thousand or so. Um, survivors and refugees who are still alive. If, if you say nice things about it, thank I you. Do. <laughs> um, I wonder, I mean, obviously, you know, they're, they're not but by any sense denied. What would be your, the particular message for them in your book? <coughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm being asked a message, and I'm, this is what it's all about. It is the message. The message is remember. And don't let it, don't let it happen again. I think you once told me the story, Daniel, of uh, Holocaust Memorial Day, when um, some, and it was an MP who said, um, it's been wonderful to be here today. And I say, never again. That's <laughs> <laughs> very penalty in the first speech. Yeah. It's a fantastic. This is an amazing event. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I have to say, never again. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wish I had something more, more intelligent to say to you. But that, that's it. And also, this is a very fascinating man I'm writing about. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, OK. Hello, Eric, by the way. Uh, um, I'll come to you next. And so somebody can get the microphone up there. That'd be great. Yeah, I've got the mic. Yeah. <laughs> I've got the mic, so I'll speak. Oh, okay. I'm Max. Thank you very much for your talk. I wondered what the personal challenges were for you writing a biography of a living subject. That must be very difficult. You expressed in your talk some points about which you disagreed with them. And obviously a, a book is a very personal thing for the writer to chance for you to proffer your opinions and reflections. But when the subject matter of your book is there to say, this is my life, this is what I think happened, I think what I think, what challenges did that pose to you? 
The challenge is to make it no different from if the person had been dead for 50 years. That's the challenge. On the other hand, there is the advantage of consultation. Ben, did this really happen? Or what happened, you mentioned this road or the street where you live, or sort of, who are the neighbors there? The sort of thing you wouldn't read otherwise, if you know. I think, I, I often say about a biography, you see, um, it's rather like being given uh, a jigsaw puzzle in a box, no picture on the lid. You shake it all up and suddenly you realize that's a bit of a house, that's a bit of a, a car, it's a bit of a garden. And the pieces fit. That's what a biography should be. The, the story fits, but once or, once or twice you come across another story and you think, I don't believe that. Well, how could it happen? So then you call other people, you call witnesses. And the great advantage, of course, is you have the, the witness available to you. The disadvantage would be, and Ben was not that, is when the subject of the biography regard, cooperates as an, as an authorized biography and regards it as his own autobiography. It's as though, as far as he's concerned, he's looking in the mirror. But you look in the mirror and the picture is back to front. Right, thank you. Uh, well, most tough to, to Ben for his night out. And Michael, I'm, I'm three quarters of the way through the book. It's a, a great book, and uh, Thank you. just to uh, put you up, I urge everyone to buy a copy this evening. Um, I, I'm acutely aware that in that uh, great film, Denial, I'm sat approximately where David Irving uh, stood in this, this hall to ask the question. Well, I think I'll ask a slightly less aggressive question. I, 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 and it's this. We talk about Germany. In the 1930s, with the possible exception of Scotland, there was no place in Europe with a better education system, yeah, yeah. with a, um, a, a, a greater engagement in, uh, in, in civil society. So if it can happen there, it can happen absolutely anywhere. And if there are perhaps two defining moments of the modern age, the first is the French Revolution, and the second is the Holocaust. Uh, what we found when the last survivor, the last person that recognized the French Revolution um, had died, the history book started to be reassessed, it started to be rewritten. And in the next decade or so, that's going to happen for the Holocaust. How can we prove? And it being different from the French Revolution, because no one was disputing the French Revolution actually happened. How can we hold the truth from people deliberately twisting and deliberately denying that six million people were murdered in Europe? You know what um, Mao Zedong said about the French Revolution? It's too early to make a decision about it. Um, I'm, I'm frightened it's going to be too late to make it, to continue the judgment. That's the job, it's continuing the judgment. People have started, are opening up about it, we're having a huge amount of documentation of it. Schindler's List, uh, incredible. I remember sitting in a, at a press preview of um, Schindler's List with the tears rolling down my cheek. Yeah, more like that perhaps. On the other hand, Chief Rabbi Jacobovitz said we mustn't be identified by, by the Holocaust. That's another way of looking at it. I, I'm not sure I agree with that, actually. Okay. So can you, can you finish the last part of the sentence? Did he, did he compete against the Polish team and what were the emotions? I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
So I think, this is Morris, uh, but just over, over right, it's just so what everybody can hear what Dad is saying. In, in answer to your question, Emmanuel, Dad did compete against uh, <laughs> Polish competitors. Dad was very competitive, but in sport, it's a healthy and strong and good competition. And Dad walked out as a captain of the British Olympic team, and when he competed in weightlifting against the Polish team, he was absolutely proud to lead the British team. Let's probably leave that tonight for one more question, which if anyone else doesn't ask, I'm not doing it for asking myself. So it's probably one thing I want to ask. Okay, I've been rolled to the back. Because there's a question just to the lady just over there. Hello, my name's uh, Diana, Diana Lazarus. Um, you mentioned the capo, the Jewish policeman, and I'm always so humbled by the other end of the spectrum. And I wonder whether in your experience, or indeed Ben's experience, you came across uh, the righteous Gentile, and whether you have any explanation or understanding why in those extraordinary circumstances people were prepared to risk their lives to save us. I wasn't talking about the Kappas, they were very different. There were people in the camps who were scraping for a, I don't know, for a, for a crust and were not guaranteed, but there was a promise possibly by moving the bodies into the gas, into the gas moving people into the gas chambers, shoving bodies into the ovens. It was a terrible, terrible thing to do, but they weren't, they weren't killing people. The police were very, very different. And some of them were good, but some of them were just gangsters. I think that's a difference you, you've got to think about. What was the rest of the, the question? Was that, uh, that sort of heart of it was about the, the other end of the spectrum, the righteous Gentile, for example, uh, where, uh, yeah. and how much did you encounter that? What, what, what sort of experience or understanding of that? I have encountered the, right, the righteous Gentiles many, many times. And I think that's, they're good people who, are, who will always be good people. And I don't think they did it particularly like Jews necessarily, they probably did. But that wasn't the feeling. The, 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 the motives were terrible things have happened or are happening. I've, I'm a human being, I've got to do something about it. There is a lady in the synagogue to which I belong, a non-Jewish lady who comes every week. She's the first, first person in the ladies' gallery. And she just said, I just think this is, this is my religion because Jews have suffered so much, I want to do something about it. I can't do very much. She was quite elderly. She is quite elderly. Uh, there is that thing. Personal story. Um, I have a very, very close non-Jewish friend. And for years he was saying to me, um, oh, I went out with this lovely Jewish couple last week, or I played golf with these Jewish men. And eventually I plucked up the courage and said, Dennis, I wish you wouldn't keep saying that. It's not relevant, and it almost strikes me as being on the verge of being offensive. Just that's how I felt at that moment. When the business of anti-Semitism the Labour Party came out, he phoned me. He said, now, no, Michael, you don't want me to talk about this. I just want to give you some solidarity. He's a righteous Gentile. And, uh, and I think if God forbid there would ever been trouble, he would have helped. Well, that was, that was really, really rather magnificent, and we're all very, very grateful, and I'd like to, to, to say a few words. First to you, Michael, um, because I remember listening to your radio show as a younger person as well, and if I remember correctly, I remember Dad being encouraging us to listen to your radio show, and I even once remember listening to Dad on your radio show. So our association goes back a very long time, you as a magnificent broadcaster and biographer. And I think, Max Twyvey, you hit the nail on the head when you asked the question of what kind of challenge is it to write a biography. 
of a living subject, a subject that's still strong and tenacious and determined and has strong views, uh, and that applies to both the author <laughs> and the subject <laughs> of the biography. And I think that you have written a biography which takes your perspective, tells the story as you see it, and for me personally, you said that it's difficult for the subject of the biography to look in the mirror and see it accurately. For the child of the subject, reading the biography, it's also hard to see it accurately. But having read the book and now listened to the wonderful, warm, generous, fluid way in which you describe the contents of the book and way you, the way you've written it, it brings to me the particular perspective and generosity that you have and really illuminates the wonderful stories and aspects of the book. It's not a political book, it's not a historical book, it is exactly what you say it is. It is a personal story about an individual man and your admiration of that man very much comes through and we're very grateful for the huge effort for the many, year, many years in fact that you've done to make that book. So thank you very much. I'd also like to say, Daniel, that it was really a great privilege for you to introduce and, and conduct and host this evening. When, we, when it was suggested that you might do it, um, you couldn't do the original date. And we spoke and you said, please, please, can we change the date? Because I really, really want to do this. I'm a great fan of your father and I'm really looking forward to doing this with Michael. And you said that the Holocaust illuminates the case for liberal democracy. And you've argued that in your writings and in your speeches in the House of Lords on a number of occasions. And I know I speak for everybody in this room and many others, that when you, you make a very, very powerful case for liberal democracy in a civilized, tolerant, intelligent, sensitive way, almost every day, and you are a huge, huge credit to this community and we really appreciate you. I'd like to thank you particularly as well. You, you, together with your colleagues here at the JW3, run an excellent program of Holocaust education and activities, and you've put a lot of effort with your colleagues into organizing tonight's event, and we really, really appreciate it. And, and, and also Angela, Angela Cohen, who's, who, who is mentioned in the book and whose parents whose father features particularly in the book, Angela has taken the lead as the chairman of the 45 AIDS Society for the second generation. One of dad's really, really strong impetuses is that the second and the third generation take responsibility for continuing to tell the story in, the, in our own personal way. And Angela is leading that as the chairman of the second generation and with other 45 AIDS Society colleagues here, has organized some, some drinks and some, uh, some, whatever, cakes and other things that please everybody's invited to come and join here afterwards through here uh, for um, the opportunity for Michael and Dad to sign the book. Now, um, there are different ways of telling a story, and a, during the time that Michael was writing the book, my brothers and I uh, made a little film about Dad, and we tried to think about how we could bottle up his essence for the family. And we uh, have made that film quietly, and we will be showing that film here at JW3 in September. And we thought that it might be nice at the end of this evening to take three minutes of your time to show a trailer for that movie. What does getting older mean? Who is the real you? Is that the real you? Or is this the real you? Your grandchildren they see you as we see grandparents. It's a really close up on our face. They don't really understand you as a younger man. Hello, cat. Is this 
is the earliest piece of footage we have. It's hard to believe that just 40 years ago, a cultured and civilized society of responsible adults could systematically burn children and line up old people and shoot them. Fortunately, however, some Jews managed to survive. Among those, my father, Ben Halfgott. Dad, can you first explain why you think it is so important to talk about the Holocaust? I can't come in the show with them. No, there will be nothing. Nothing. Only nothing. But there was so much, and there could have been so much more. Is it impossible for you to find peace? Oh, I've always found peace in myself. I have learned to live with the path of my life, right from the very beginning. Where's the camera? I did not think that I had ever reached this age. The 20th artists representing 19 countries are lined up and all eager to get started. Coast Guard from Great Britain and Northern Ireland. He presses 242 pounds. One can't help feeling about the injustice of of destroying six million innocent people. That is why it's such an interesting point here. Whether you forgive or you don't forget, you do not necessarily have to go on hating. I never hated the Holds, and I never hated anybody. I mean, I'd like that, but if you can hit me, and... No, you can. But I don't want to. <laughs> now look at the past, and I can see it contextually. I can see what was happening. The Germans knew that there were quite a number of Jews who went into hiding. Those Jews were known as the illegal ones. I think Ben was probably very single-minded and focused totally on the Olympics. I don't think he would have had time for romance. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you are. Don't forget what I told you. Yes. What did you say? <laughs> to me, the most important are the children. They are the beginning of the human being. And he has a ginormous breakfast. This is the reason why I have always been a serious child. I must go. I have to carry it. I can't, I can't, I can't live any other way. History is not predetermined by fate. People make history and people can change it. Thank you.